So, these recovery compression boots, we know that there are high-level athletes that are using them, but do they actually work in practice? Let's find out. Hey guys, Khaled here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So, here's another really interesting piece of equipment. These recovery compression boots are being used more and more in the sporting world. And if you check out Instagram, you'll see pictures of high profile athletes such as Gareth Bale, the footballer, or Anthony Joshua, the boxer, using these in their recovery period following their sporting events. So let's dive into some of the evidence as to whether or not they have a significant benefit. So before we get started, make sure to smash that like button and let's dive in. So first of all, what do these compression boots actually do? Well, some of the sites that advertise them describe it, and I'll read it to you as follows. So, these use dynamic air compression to advance your wellness, recover faster, improve your training, and maximize your performance. Now, when you read details in the literature, one of the key terms that comes up time and time again is intermittent pneumatic compression. So almost like an air pressured massage, which is massaging the legs with the key aim of improving circulation and therefore allowing an athlete to recover faster following their most recent sporting event. So with that in mind, what does the evidence actually say? Well, let's take a look at this brilliant paper from Stedge and Armstrong in 2021, link in the description below, by the way, which appraises some of the key pieces of evidence that surround this intermittent pneumatic compression. Let's call it IPC for short. And the idea is that these particular papers focused on the effect of IPC on DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. Now, as you can imagine, in the period of recovery for an athlete, reducing the amount of DOMS that the athlete has is critically important. And this is the key thing that IPC, intermittent pneumatic compression, seems to aim to reduce. So Stedge and Armstrong effectively appraised three key papers, and these three key papers all looked at the effects of IPC in long distance runners. The long distance runners used this treatment for four to seven days post injury, and they were using it on a daily basis. Now, some of the key outcomes that they looked at included outcome measures about pain and muscle fatigue, but also really interestingly, a timed run. And the idea being is that this aimed to look at the physiological effect of IPC and whether it actually translates into a performance improvement when it's used on a daily basis. Okay, so what were the results? Well, unfortunately, they didn't really see any major significant improvement with IPC in either the subjective markers of pain or the muscle fatigue or in the timed run for the performance aspect of things. However, two out of the three papers did demonstrate some evidence of a moderate improvement subjectively from a single use of IPC. So what is some improvement? Well, let's take a look at these diagrams, which illustrate the comparisons quite nicely. So first of all, on one side, we can see the comparison of the muscle pain and the muscle soreness ratings between the groups. And on the other side, we can see the comparison in the 400 meter run time between the groups to look at performance. Now on both of these graphs, the blue line, the light blue line, is the control group or the no intervention group. And the orange line is the IPC, the Intermittent Pneumatic Compression Group. Now, you can see that there's a small improvement in both the muscle pain and soreness ratings and a little bit of an improvement in the 400 meter runtime in that the orange line is slightly lower than the light blue line in both groups. However, as you can see, the difference isn't major. Now, there are other things to consider. For example, none of the papers really included a sham group, a sham massage group, for example, to see if there was much of a placebo effect there. And there are other pieces of evidence which also show limited benefit. So why do the athletes therefore use them? Well, I think for me, my impression is that it comes down to psychology. We've talked about this with a couple of different interventions, such as K-tape in the sporting world, where a lot of the time when it comes to athletes at the real top level, psychology and confidence levels makes a massive impact on belief. And if an athlete believes that they're doing more to improve their recovery, perhaps with these compression boots, if it feels good, if it feels to them like it's making an impact, then that probably is enough to actually create a psychological impact. And I'm sure that it might be the case that because it feels so good, 
it's natural to think that there is an impact from these recovery boots. However, a really interesting spin on this is the potential use of this IPC in non-athletes and in fact in acute care in hospitals because there is research looking at the effects of these recovery boots in preventing a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. So when we're thinking about DVTs, a formation of a clot, the most common area in the body for this to occur is in the calf. And this helps us understand the theory behind these compression boots, that they try to simulate the activity of the thigh, the calf and the foot's normal ambulatory pump action in order to improve venous circulation, thus increasing the volume and the rate of blood flow, thus eliminating venous stasis and replicating the effects of the natural muscle pump. So when a patient perhaps has a planned surgery, such as a total knee replacement, could they be given these compression boots in order to prevent DVTs following their surgery? So if we check out the research for this, for example, Pavon et al, and you can get this link in the description below, they looked at the effectiveness of IPC for at-risk post-surgical patients. They looked at 17 different studies and found that actually the combination of IPC with anticoagulant drugs could be more effective than anticoagulant drugs by themselves. Furthermore, we have this paper from Quack et al, again, link in the description below, looking at the effects of IPC for post-total hip arthroplasty patients. And in fact, they found that the use of IPC reduced the risk of DVTs by 30% in the IPC group compared to the non-IPC group. This is really big, and actually, this has been one of the catalysts for the use of IPC for preventing DVTs in major guidelines, such as the NICE guidelines in the UK. So certainly something to look out for for your ward patients. So overall, does it work? Well, let's talk again about those two different groups. First of all, the elite level athletes. And whilst the evidence doesn't really support a major improvement in recovery from IPC, perhaps there is a psychological improvement. And if IPC helps to increase the belief of athletes that they're improving their recovery levels, that might even make the tiniest difference in order to improve marginal gains for their performance in their events. Then we looked at the inpatient acute care wards where it can be used to prevent DVTs and there definitely is evidence to support it in this environment. So it could well be something we see more and more in the future. So guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. Remember to subscribe to our channel and we've got loads more resources on our Instagram account at Clinical Physio and on our website, clinicalphysio.com. I'm Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.